face it Like it or not Each and every one of us should be As important As each other In a democracy Even those Who are helpless Through no fault of their own No serene Treat them well They are our children And they rely on us Totally In a democracy In a democracy Oh yeah We all have our crosses to bear Let's face it Like it or not Each and every one of us should be As important As each other In a democracy Even those Who are no good No good at anything No serene Just remember They are our leaders And we vote for them Foolishly In a democracy In a democracy Oh yeah We all have our crosses to bear In a democracy Oh yeah We all have our crosses to bear Neil, can you tell me the what were your earliest musical influences? Uh, the radio I think as a toddler, you know, um, I used to sort of conduct it with a ruler. I, sort of, I loved it, you know, whatever it was, you know, big bands, classical, everything. I just related to it from an infant. So, um, but didn't have lessons until I was about seven. And my father and mother, and my father was in the army and, and got posted to Germany. And... Um, we had a piano, so, the, you know, I was plonking on it, and they, well, they got me some lessons, and I had a most wonderful German bloke who taught me, and he was, you know, this is the, the thing about, you know, you, you go to Germany because of the World War or whatever, and you find that some Germans are perfectly reasonable human beings. It's confusing in a way. But, it, you know, you get to the, the, the time where... Your left hand has to do something different to your right hand. And I think it's, at about the age of seven, you know, when I said I had to do this, you know, I, I declared that it was impossible. But, you know, not like some terrible teachers you hear about that hit your fingers and things with rulers or whatever. So, well, Neil, I, I think if you observe me closely, <laughs> you will see that my left hand is doing this and my right hand is doing that. And I knew I was wrong. <laughs> you know? But then it, I kind of got hooked on it, and I, I, you know, surfed into it. It was really good. In your travels as a child, uh, was there any particular type of music that was totally unusual that you'd never heard before that held a fascination? Not not so much as a child. I mean, I can remember as a child listening to live music. And very, you know, I was always impressed by sort of open air bands. And I suppose being near military, there was often parades and things like that. And I often think, you know, today, you know, if there's so much music in elevators and supermarkets and everything, you know, 
the novelty is sort of worn off. But if you were in a village somewhere, and all of a sudden round the corner came these blokes banging animal skins and blowing through metal tubes, you, you'd, you'd, you'd get excited. And you'd, you'd, you know, it would lift you. What is this? You know, and uh, uh, so that, you know, that magic has is sort of gone because of uh, thing. But the, uh, I mentioned the radio before, but all the songs in the fifties were extraordinary. I mean, Billy Connolly went on to sort of to sort of deride them and sort of thank God for rock and roll, you know, because they, they were singing songs like "Give me five minutes more, five minutes more, what?" You know, and but I remember songs like "Twenty Tiny Fingers, Twenty Tiny Toes." Two angel faces, each with a turned up nose. One looks like mommy with a cute little girl on top. And the other one's got a big bald spot, exactly like his pop, 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 pop. And popular music was this kind of, we've just been through a world war, let's cheer up and any old rubbish would, would do. But, you know, I absorbed it all like blotting paper. And I remember, the, what's it, I remember thinking quite fiercely about, you know... Um, a man is a two-face, a worrisome thing that will leave you, lead you to sing the blues in the night. And I thought, I'm a, I'm gonna, that's not very fair, woman. You know. <laughs> yes, and the uh, because they do say that a ventriloquist has hard work today. Because kids are not impressed. No, I bet not. <laughs> Where, where's the recorder? <laughs> is he on MP3? Yeah. <laughs> Stuffed in it. You were saying a well, Serbian brass band. On my travels, as you, you know, not as a child, but certainly a couple of years ago, I went to Slovenia to, with some, some friends. They were called Terra Folk. And they, they worked with me and uh, what I adore them. They're fantastic. And um, Janusz, the accordion player, bass player, <laughs> So it suddenly rang up where we were and said, you've got to come to this restaurant, you know? Wow, okay, you know, but they, they drop everything. Everyone dropped, jumped in the cars, went around to this place, and, and they have about four trumpeters. Two, no, two main solo trumpeters. There's four euphonium players, and they're all playing one note of the chord. So, and the chords change, obviously, and they, they do weird 13 8 time signatures. Whatever that was, I don't know. But um, the, each note of the chord on the euphonium is going. It's a chord. And there's a, a drum and things like that. And it. And it's the most exciting sound I've ever seen. And, and what they do, they, the trumpeters come right round to the, and they play to the little groups. And you know, you're supposed to give them money, you know. And one of them put the trumpet right in my ear. And I had to sort of like trust him. And he played the most quiet little thing, you know, masterly playing. And uh, so, you, you really, because you've still got an ear at the end, you sort of tip him well, you know, because he <laughs> hasn't actually injured you. <laughs> but they apparently they've got must have lips like leather, you know, because they can apparently Serbian weddings can go on for three days, you know, and they were tireless. It, it, but it was the most exciting sound, and we all came away with our faces aching from smiling, you know, at the excitement of it all. Is there a comical uh, singer, entertainer, vaudeville, or the likes of, from history, who you would love to have seen perform live? I feel very privileged because I did actually see Max Wall perform live uh, in Greenwich Theatre. Tom McGuinness, McGuinness Flint and Manfred Mann. Mm. Um, he was spotted it was on, and we all went down there. And he, he'd been in the wilderness for years. And he came back and he did his Professor Warlowski and stuff like that. And, and he was just a master clown. And, you know, the, the fact he had a, it was just really good on recording, so But he put his hand out to play the piano. Mm. And one hand would be longer than the other. So he'd pull that one back and it would be shorter <laughs> than the other one. And there'd be all this... And where's Miss Stool? And this kind of thing. And the tights, you know, the bald head. 
and whatever. And it was wonderful. Anyway, he, he was interviewed by The Guardian later, and he said, no, I've had a wonderful time in Greenwich Theatre. All these hippies came to see me. <laughs> but I met him later working on Jabberwocky right. uh, with Terry Gilliam, yeah. And we sat in a pub and the jukebox came on suddenly from another bar, this sort of like raucous thing. And he, Max, you, you have to imagine his face, he's going, hear that? It's a cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> Max Wall had an encore where um, he would, you know, people would be stamping and shouting more, more, more. And he would come on one side of the stage holding up a stick of celery. <laughs> And he would wait until everyone absolutely quiet. And it took a while, you know. And then, when they, okay, they realised the game was be quiet and they'll say something. They all went absolutely quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, Mussolini's left leg. I thank you. And he'd walk off with a stick of celery. Uh, more, 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 more. And he'd come on from the other side of the stage with a stick of celery in his other hand, you know. And again, they had to wait until they were got quiet. I said, ladies and gentlemen, Mussolini's right leg. I thank you. <laughs> you know, and he'd go off. <laughs> and then he'd go, come on, come on, come on. And then he, he came on with two enormous potatoes and held them above his head in the centre of the stage. And, of course, there's a lot of, you know, bulgous giggling and whatever going on. Eventually they all quietened down. And he's got potatoes above his head and he says, no, madam. You're wrong. These are King Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a uh, comedy songwriter performer of today who, whose act you admire, who you would like to catch, who you never have? Um, I wouldn't say comedy so much, but a really good, in my view underrated but I'm, I'm just said more people have heard of him than, than not John Prine I admire so much as a songwriter I really really like his songs but you wouldn't say they were funny but uh, they were so, they're certainly vivid you know beautiful lyrics I mean uh, there's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes Jesus Christ died for nothing I suppose about Vietnam Veterans. Fight of ourselves. That's one of his. Isn't is it? it? Well, and yeah, there's, there's, and there was, a one that Sandy did the other night. You know, I am an old woman. And and it's it's fun. It, no, it's beautiful. It's like it's like taking really good, accurate Cartier-Bresson-like photographs with lyrics. You know, of the life that it can go on. But no, I mean, I've, Billy Connolly is. I've, you know, I've. I've worked with him live, but I've never actually been to... I've seen his shows, but never actually been to a live one. I wouldn't mind uh, being... Uh, but, of course... But I, I can remember we did the um, the Amnesty International night, and Billy was on there, and Eric Clapton and I were behind the curtains <laughs> saying, get off your scotch git, you know, we're running late, you know. And he said... I gotta do another five minutes because the the sobering up the rock and roll stars. <laughs> so you don't heckle the master, you know. <laughs> no, that's a hard one. I mean, no, I, I I'm I'm good friends with uh, Emo Phillips, and um, Emo is uh, I like his humour, his take. He said any of my jokes are possible. I said, well, well, how do you mean? He said, well. Take an example, you know, I got into trouble on my date last night. I forgot to open the car door for her. <laughs> Instead, I just swam for the surface. <laughs> Do you uh, believe that the uh, ukulele is a good starting point in song construction? Ah, well, I, I think it's a great songwriting aid because... You can sit quietly musing, you know, and playing with different chords, and you get an honest chord of, of ukulele, and, and, and very often it can be quite subtle. Um, so, yeah, who was it? Greenaway and Cook uh, wrote lots of songs together. Roger Greenaway, he had a, a large ukulele, which he always wrote songs on. 
Um, that's that's back in the eighties or even earlier. You know, so he was. Um, so you know, I, I, I've written a couple of songs directly onto the ukulele, two or three, you know. But um, more and more, you don't often break a string on a ukulele, mm. and I broke this first string, and I, oh, I just grabbed another string, and I assumed it was the right one, but it's not. It's a bass one. So what I've got here is. So, uh, so if that instead of it being up here, wherever, it, so it would normally be. Oh, I can't remember it, isn't it? It's a whole different instrument. So, which no, what note is that? that um, it's exactly the normal tuning, but the first the and the bass. fourth string are an octave bass. low. Brilliant. But it works in a nice mellow way, you know. Accident. You may. You should have a fiddle. It's probably not absolutely bang on in tune, but. Accidents are just, you know. Have you taught anyone to play the ukulele? Children, oh. offspring, or? Yeah, but I mean, I'm. I, if, unless they, they come back and say, what was that bit again? No, I, I don't pester them. <laughs> I've shown the grandchildren a chord or two. But, um, no, I don't think that's it's in them, you know, to sort of you want to persist with it. But uh, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know whether I'd be a good teacher or not. I'm quite a patient person, but and but I, I certainly wouldn't force anybody to sort of go through any pain barriers of learning. Because unless you, unless it sort of lights you up, you know, it, it it is. I think music is uh, somebody. Gombrich or somebody like that said it, all art aspires to the condition of music and it is abstract it's as abstract as you can get and, um, and, and unless you have an affinity with it somewhere inside, if, if you have to count I mean I had this um, argument with John Williams, the guitarist you know, he loves playing with sort of Chileans and all that sort of thing and, and I said you know, well, it's nice, isn't it? You just have to go with the flow. He said, no, I count it. I said, John, you can't possibly count that. How can you count that? You've got sixes over fours. And he said, no, no, you have to count it. We nearly had quite an argument over it in the car. But, uh, but I mean, uh, that's it. You know, you, I think having a sense of rhythm is probably the key. A lot of people can play the notes, but they actually can't keep time. Yeah. I mean, I think... Yeah, various other artists, uh, including Phil Dolman, who is one of the top ukulele players, certainly in Britain, he has pointed out 
even when he teaches, the hardest thing you can ever do is teach people the feel on an instrument. Oh yeah, you can't. You can't teach it, I don't think. You have to. You can probably attempt to wake it up. <laughs> teach? No, I don't think so. Which instrument um, did you play first, the guitar or the ukulele? Well, really the guitar, because, I mean, that's, the guitar is what I turned to when I stopped playing classical music on the piano at the age of 14, because it seemed that every time I finished a piece, they gave me a harder one. And I sort of rebelled, and I thought, who am I working for here? So I got this terrible egg slicer guitar and, um, and, and stuck at it, because, you know, it was an exciting instrument. Um, but I, I don't play the guitar properly. I don't bar the chords properly, uh, because the strings were so bad on the first guitar I had. It, was, it came out of a junk shop. It was only 30 shillings or something. <laughs> um, and uh, well, yeah, and I started writing my own music and drew, drew, the, drew the staves out with biro and whatever. And uh, so I stopped sight reading and all the rest of it and, and started strumming. And uh, when did I get my first ukulele? Probably about 20 years ago, really. I didn't really... Other people had ukuleles. Um, Urban Spaceman... When we were recording Urban Spaceman, Viv had a ukulele, and him being left-handed, and then Paul McCartney had offered to produce the thing. So when you hear Urban Spaceman, it's Paul playing the ukulele. And, and he's doing that, like a Nashville thing, sort of going, ding, 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 ding. And they're just coming in on the microphone going, anky, janky, 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 janky. You know, and they're coming off. And actually, it's funny because the our producer uh, Jerry Bron, his wife Lillian, who's a very sort of county kind of lady, she went to Oxford, and she never came to recording. But because Paul was there, she turned up and said, so "Paul's got the ukulele," and she goes up to him and says, "Oh, what's that you've got there? A poor man's violin." <laughs> and Paul immediately, without said, "No, it's a rich man's ukulele." <laughs> Uh, no, but the, I, I, I fell in love with it, you know, much later on in life, you know. The guitar was a sort of second instrument, which, again, I, I've worked harder at, but not as hard as it should. You know, because other guitarists are so much better than me. Because you know? <laughs> um, they do that. And you, you know, I, I'm limited. I'm a sort of Richie Haven's thumb over, thrasher. <laughs> you know, I can keep rhythm. I've got rhythm, you know, and I can... I probably have more courage than sense sometimes. But did you uh, did you ever play uh, ukulele with George Harrison? Yeah. Oh yes, yes. Um, well, George used to carry two around with him. He also had wild. He was the, he was the kind of Liberace of uh, ukuleles. <laughs> this chap called Danny Farrington who lives in Los Angeles. He's an Irish guy, but he makes wonderful ukuleles and he, he made George several sort of bespoke silly ones he had one in fake cheetah fur <laughs> <laughs> you know and so yeah no but there's a memorable moment um, in George's garden and, and Eric was there I was there Ringo was there uh, and Danny was there and Danny had the camera that George was always filming with him. And, and George um, with the ukulele, and so we're all in a line just posing for a photograph or something like that. And he started going this a slow strumming and going, ouch. <laughs> ouch. I mean, we all started, the, you know, your mother should go kind of dancing. <laughs> it, was, it was a surreal moment, you know, it was like two Beatles and two Ruttles <laughs> going, ouch, <laughs> with the ukulele. Did you. Um, at about the time when Tiny Tim managed to put the nail in the coffin on the ukulele <laughs> for a 30 year hiatus mm -hmm. during that hiatus uh, you obviously as you said uh, played ukulele uh, what other musicians do you recollect besides the late George Harrison playing with ukulele 
Well, I think more and more people have got. I don't. I don't. I think Stevie Wynn would have one. But I mean, I must tell you, you know, the Bonzos actually played the Albert Hall with Tiny Tim. Right. And we couldn't get get over it. You know, the, the extraordinary thing. But there was somebody. In fact, it was uh, oh, what's his name from the Hollies, who was making a film of it, and. Um, and we thought, well, if you're making a film, we would have this sort of like walkway for Larry to come out and tap dance on, which he collapses, you know. So we had all that built and all this happening and whatever. But then, you know, out comes Tiny Tim with, there's a fellow following me, whatever, you know. And we're, oh, well. But, it, it, but later on, when the Bonzos went to New York, we had a, a publicist called. Ren Gravatt. And, and he came up with a line for the Bonzos. It's six tiny Tims with balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. We cried at first and then we got angry and sacked him. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I should say, you know, in, in the sort of 60s time, there weren't that many around. Not in, 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 uh, as there are now, you know, and, and I think it's a word of warning, you know, there's, because there's a lot of them out there just sort of decorative and uh, intended for car boot sales because they're not real instruments. You won't ever tune them, you know, they're, they're, they're souvenirs of somewhere with, you know, mm. Benidorm painted on them or something, you know. But yeah, but there, but there's, there's so many to choose from. I mean, one of my this one I got in Atlanta, and I think any instrument that makes you want to play vibrato is a good one. find out what it sounds like no, I definitely find out what it sounds like but I find you're always playing the wrong shape for the, the actual tonic thing you're doing like if you play a G shape on a guitar you're playing C on a ukulele so to avoid the scrambled egg of instant transposition all the time which I find like it's impossible I just think I'm playing in the key I'm playing, and I play like that but I forget about the fact that it's so yeah, I know sevenths, I know augmented and things like that, but it's not a big deal with me. I know some people, you know, sort of study it a lot, but uh, uh, you know, George didn't um, care what the chord was called. In fact, he once said, you know, I don't care if it's called Horace or Arthur, as long as it sounds good, it's all right. Yeah. And, and there's that weird chord he does on, isn't it a pity? Um, which I can't it, on the ukulele it wouldn't work but it's like it's a D minor shape on the bottom three, four, fifth and sixth strings and it's a sort of major seventh but it isn't you know and if you look at the, the Albert Hall thing when Eric's um, well I thought did a fantastic MD job and get me all that like four drummers come on and uh, so he's going, isn't it a pity? And he went, oh, it's the last minute. He just got into that awkward shape, which you never normally do there, you know. And it's, um, it's uh, George was always making up chords, so not necessarily naming them. <laughs> wrote on the ukulele for my 65th birthday. Lots of people came. Um, I used to think I could think things through Now any notion I fancy will do 
My lifetime's false is divided by truth Old age becomes me So many memories to recall Good times, bad times, big and small Now like New England after the fall Old age becomes me The sycamores and willows stand tall down by the stream My blanket is a jacaranda blue Among my extra pillows I'd still know how to dream Someday I'm gonna run away with you I know life is much more than My limited attention span Now all I do is all I can Old age becomes me Humming Across the universes where all of us must go Sooner or later by and by But what is far, far worse is all those people who know Who claim they can explain the reasons why I've had my fill of all the ballyhoo Enough of soft shoe shuffles too. Now, like the you know the I like the young and beautiful. Well, you know what they can do. <laughs> Old age becomes me. Should have a better jazz chord to end. In this day and age of where music is available just like that on YouTube. What is your reaction to the fact that in some books, up and down the country, all around the world, there is the urban spaceman in, in caudal format? Well, I think it's great, because, I mean, there is no finer compliment to a songwriter than if somebody wants to sing your song. I have no problem with that. My problem was with global corporations who don't pay you the money you're supposed to get, you know. And I'm not alone. Everybody I know in the business, green room chatter is one of deep melancholy when it comes to being ripped off by the people who are supposed to be, you know, batting for you. Neil Innes, thank you very much. John, it's been a pleasure. Shaking hands now. Yeah. <laughs>